can change the American world. American Renewable Energy Institute, Chip Cummins, welcome. Hi, Stan. Uh, okay, so renewable energy, I've been hearing about it for years, and I may even see it when I go to Southern California. Is it here, and is it real? Absolutely. Uh, it's been the fastest growing sector of the utility scale wind industry for the last 15 years, and that's just one uh, sector of the uh, renewable energy space. But uh, renewables are here, they're coming, they make sense on pretty much every level, and now they're competing uh, on a head-to-head uh, -head basis with, uh, with the traditional forms of energy, coal, gas, oil, and all the fossils. When you say head-to-head, -head, that sounds like it's financially they're able to compete. Absolutely right, and uh, even though uh, wind has some subsidies, and, and as does solar, so does, um, so does oil, oil yeah. coal, and gas, and, and have had for 90 plus years. Uh, I happen to be an advocate for, uh, for leveling the playing field and taking away all the subsidies, and let's go from that point of, uh, <coughs> of, of, of uh, insertion. But the reality is, is that renewables are, are here, they're growing, and they consistently uh, get a little bit more market share each year. Mm. Well, let's dive into that subsidy issue just for a minute then. Um, you, you really think that the, the playing field would be leveled if subsidies were you know, gotten rid of? And secondly, this, for the American public standpoint, I mean, they are subsidizing oil today? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, people don't know about the intangible drilling allowance that uh, has been on the books, the sacred cow of uh, fossil fuels uh, for, for 90 plus years. But we do always hear about the uh, production tax credit for wind, uh, as an mm -hmm. example, that Congress typically will hold hostage every couple of years. You know, that's only been approved now for, I think, one more year since the last time. And, and the problem there is that, you know, when you're doing these enormous deals, uh, say a 500 megawatt wind farm at 2 million bucks a megawatt, so that's a, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're talking about all the infrastructure and what it costs to put them in the land and the environmental impact statements and so forth, the whole process, uh, it really has to do with having a long view. And so banks want to see that, you know, that that, that, that financial instrument is not going to go away in a couple of years because all of a sudden the factories, you know, stop, um, you know, anticipating the, the demand and, and it begins to shut the system down, whether it's solar or wind uh, and what have you. So uh, it would be nice if we're going to have subsidies, let's, let's have equal subsidies for all or take them away hmm. and, and compete on a, on a level playing field. Let's define renewable energy. Is it just solar and wind? No, no. Of course, it also includes uh, <coughs> biofuels and um, energy efficiency really is, is, is the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, you know, the energy that we can save is worth more than, than what we can produce. Uh, in other words, we're not fairly telling the truth on a balance sheet. The impacts of burning all this coal and oil and gas and what they do to our environment, what they do to the atmosphere, increasing the concentrations of carbon that are directly connected to the increase in all of these super storms that we're seeing, the floods, the droughts, uh, the impacts on our forests, the trees are dying. You know, I believe, and the science backs it up, that this is directly connected to the amount of fossil fuels that the human beings have been putting into the atmosphere. And so we need to be able to put that, we have to be accountable for that, and, and then talk about uh, renewables in the same context as we talk about uh, fossil fuels as providing our our base load for our energy, and that's an, another another issue that comes up a, a lot in this this situation when we talk about um, uh, energy and renewables versus fossil. Yeah, and something else that comes up an awful lot though is that the cost to create biofuels outweighs the benefits. That's that's one of the arguments that's been out there for a while. Is that true? Well, you know, there was a food versus fuel controversy. Uh, it really isn't true when you look at how many cows we have on the planet and how much of our corn is an example that we grow to feed the cows that we then, you know, mm -hmm. feed ourselves with. And, uh, and, and by the way, on, on greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of methane that they emit is enormous. And don't forget that methane is 20 times more uh, concentrated than uh, carbon in terms of the atmospheric uh, uh, greenhouse gas situation. But, in t but, but back to your question of, uh, <clears throat> of the fossil fuels and, 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 and the renewables, 
Um, we, we really have to see ourselves as a society that needs to grow our economy in ways that can sustain us. And that's not only uh, environmentally, but also economically. And so at the uh, American Renewable Energy Institute that I chair, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, we, ha we call it the four E's, you know, which is energy, economy, uh, environment, and education. And we really want to educate ourselves that this is not going away. This is the long term. Renewables only gets better. I mean, take wind, for example. <clears throat> so you put in a wind farm, and you have your infrastructure costs, and you have all of your upfront costs of develop, developing that project, just like you would uh, if you were going to build a new coal plant. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is as the wind blows and spins the turbine and produces electricity without using any water, and that's a critical point, because water is also becoming a limited resource, yeah. <coughs> uh, that at, at some point in about seven or eight years, uh, they, be, they pay themselves off all of that money that they generate, spinning that wind. And then you've got now, for the next projected lifetime of that turbine, about, say, 18 years, uh, you've got cash flow. And, 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 and it's a beautiful financial model because it's very lucrative. That's why people are doing it, mm -hmm. you know, at the scale that they are. So that applies also to solar. It can apply to biofuels as well. You know, I personally, in the biofuels conversation, would like to see us move away from ethanol produced from corn and move into algae that actually takes carbon from the atmosphere in a liquefied form as a feedstock, feed it to the algae, and the algae itself produces, low, uh, produces biofuels that can fuel our jet planes. And the mm -hmm. Navy is doing this right now. This is technically possible. It's here today. It's just too expensive, or it's just what? Well, it is expensive, and there's a lot of barriers in terms of some of the technological breakthroughs, but even all of that aside, it's happening. At the last uh, R-Day summit that we did uh, in August, we had a panel called The Future of Fuel, and on that panel, uh, one of our sponsors, United Airlines, was talking about the fuel that they purchased from another panelist, Alt Air, and uh, <clears throat> and Solazyme was there, and they both are producing biofuels that they uh, that the Navy is buying and flying our um, our F-16s around on. This is happening today. We haven't gotten to the place where it's in mass production, but it's possible. We can get there, and by golly, we can actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and and turn it into cash, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, and create an economy that's going to, uh, in fact, run our fleets of automobiles and, and, and our airline industries and so forth. So then renewable energy can be applied to vehicles as well. Absolutely. Uh, Besides bi biofuels. Let's take biofuels out of it. Right. And another panelist, um, uh, Alejandro Agag, is the CEO of Formula E, uh, he was on that same panel that I moderated, uh, and and uh, he is the uh, the head of a company that is um, basically it's Formula One gone Tesla. It's Formula One that is now uh, operating with electric motors, and these cars are unbelievable. These Formula cars they go from zero to sixty in three seconds. Yeah, I, I actually I drove one of the Tesla sports cars and I was shocked at how fast that thing was. I know. I mean, how fast is the speed of uh, you know light, <laughs> <laughs> electricity? <laughs> but is it? Isn't the reality of why we're not moving faster into renewable energies that there is a power and an economic structure built around, a long time power and economic structure built around fossil fuels? Well, that's true. You know, we have a worldwide economy that's based uh, and pegged uh, to the extraction and burning of fossil fuels. And now we're seeing, we're at the beginning of a transition. We're sort of being forced into it, not only due to our population at 7.5 billion, <clears throat> but also uh, the way that we've been feeding ourselves as a worldwide population and, and how we're living on the planet. We've got to move into a much more benign uh, uh, form of energy that supports nature <clears throat> and supports ourselves. So renewables is the only, the only thing that we have that can do that, and mm -hmm. that's why it's growing, in my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, in spite of itself. So at the Institute, you've got um, energy, environment, education, and economics. Mm -hmm. 
you put those four things together, besides you guys, who's the big players? Who are the ones who are going to help make this happen? Well, gosh, I mean, we're actually not even big players. We're, we're sort of one of the leading, um, you know, cheerleaders. Flag perhaps. waivers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have uh, huge players in renewables. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Michael Polsky, as an example, has a company called Invenergy. He's the nation's uh, leading independent wind energy developer. But uh, GE is in, and uh, you know Ford on the uh, tr auto transport side, GM. You know this is reinvigorating our economy throughout the continuum. I mm -hmm. mean, every sector, uh, renewables is playing a role, and it's a role that's only growing. So uh, I see that uh, in terms of real economic uh, growth, and you know we just hit fifteen thousand not recent, you know r r recently. Uh, in the in the stock market, and it'll go to twenty thousand and beyond. But I believe that the real growth that's going to come is going to come in this sector. Really, tell us about the summit. You you have an annual summit. Yes. So we just uh, passed our tenth anniversary annual uh, American Renewable Energy Day summit, um, expo, and film festival, and. Uh, we are very, very proud of the fact that uh, Ted Turner uh, came for his fourth time mm -hmm. uh, since 2008, and, and also T. Boone Pickens came for his third. And why that's important is that, you know, Ted might be to the left and T. Boone might be to the right, but they meet in the middle on the green. And that is really a mm -hmm. significant thing, to be able to drop the philosophical differences and agree that green energy energy that comes from uh, clean resources is something that's good for our country. And, you know, T. Boone, he talks a lot about uh, national security and energy independence. Mm -hmm. And he's a big proponent of uh, natural gas and converting our, our, our nation's trucking fleet from the dirty diesel engines to the cleaner burning, much cleaner burning uh, natural gas, uh, compressed natural gas engines that can, that can drive our big rigs. And I agree with that. But I also think that when we talk about extraction of natural gas, which is, as we all know, going um, full guns with the fracking and so forth, that we have to use best practices. We know how to do this properly. We can get it out of the ground. We can cut our use of uh, water uh, to a minimum. And we can do it in a way that we don't pollute. So it's not only about uh, advocating for the development of wind, solar, biofuels, energy efficiency, but it's also about, <coughs> about um, advocating for uh, best practices and how we, we get energy. You know, mm -hmm. we're the American Renewable Energy uh, Day and Institute, but we're also, uh, energy is, is the baseline. Solar and wind power, where is it making a big impact in the United States today? Well, you know, wind keeps growing. Uh, I, when I started in this in 2004, we had an installed capacity nationwide of about 4,600 megawatts. I believe this last year we surpassed 60,000. Wow. And that's in not even 10 years. Yeah, that's, that's a that's huge That's nine growth. years. In fact, it's been the biggest uh, uh, growth sector of the, uh, of the uh, utility um, scale electricity business in that time period. Solar has come on very strong in the last two years. In fact, mm -hmm. there was more solar installed in this last year than there was wind, which shocked me. But that's because, you know, the, the, the Chinese have, have brought the, the cost of solar panels way down. It's been tough go for some of our, our guys here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Solyndra that went up. But the point is that solar is coming down to the to, to, the, to the levels where they are putting it in in a utility scale, and there's no reason why every roof in the United States could not become an electricity generator. We know how to solve the problem. We have to get the political will to do it, mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for in Washington, D.C., the leadership that's going to be required, uh, not only from the president, but from both houses of Congress, to enact the policies and the legislation and the laws that are going to... Uh, uh, do a, a fast implementation. We have to talk about speed and scale here in terms of implementation because, you know, quite frankly, I come from the state of Colorado and I went down to Boulder uh, as soon as I could get in there to see w the impacts of this thousand year flood. I mean, we're getting these thousand year weather events. Yeah. And they're coming fast and furious. And that's right on the heels of, of Yosemite, uh, a park burning uh, 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 an area the size of, of Rhode Island, I think it is. 
and 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 I could go on. We all know what these what these things are. So so we need to um, look at that very seriously and and then connect the dots and realize that if we can go in the direction of of renewable energy uh, in t as, as, at speed and scale at wartime speed and scale. I mean, the analogy would be similar to when Franklin Roosevelt called the captains of industry into the Oval Office back in 1942 and said, gentlemen, I need, you know, 50,000 tanks, 100,000 battleships, and his list was long, and they said, no, 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 Mr. President, you don't understand, we're making cars, trucks, and buses, and he said, no, you don't understand. You're now making tanks, ships, and planes. And we had a moratorium for a couple of years. You can't buy a 1942 Ford motor uh, vehicle. <laughs> they didn't make them then. And, and we went, and because of that, you know, uh, the, the American people uh, rose up, including the women, Rosie the Riveter, yep. and they went into the workforce, and we solved the problem. And the world, that's when I believe America became a true world leader. And the world is looking to us now on this issue. Mm -hmm. But it's not just an American problem, though. No. Um, are, are you working outside the borders of the United States? Yes, we are. Uh, we produce 13 side events in the Bella Center at COP15 mm -hmm. when the world came together and Obama was just elected. We didn't get the kind of progress that we were looking for at that time. We also went down to Cancun for COP16. And we brought Richard Branson and Ted Turner together at a, a conference to promote these uh, same values once again at the World Climate Summit and help them launch, launch that uh, organization. <coughs> and since then, uh, we've pulled back a little bit to focus on American renewable energy, but all the while knowing full well that the United States is 4% of the world's population, and yet we consume 30% of the natural resources while emitting fully 25% of the CO2 into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and that with a $16 trillion annual GDP. And that's the biggest economy in the world, and it's larger than number two by three times. And number two, of course, is China. And I bring that up for a reason because China, with their $5 trillion GDP, also produces now 25% of the carbon. So together, China and the United States put up half of all of the CO2 emissions on an annual basis. And unless and until we create a green bridge between the United States and China and lead on this issue, I really don't think much is going to happen in India or uh, South Africa or Brazil, et cetera. And so I'm really looking for President Obama and uh, President Xi Jinping to come together on this issue and, and create that bridge. I'm hopeful that their meeting in California last summer was the beginnings of, of what that will become. But I think that economically, we can work together to solve this problem, and that will lift both of our, our cultures up, and then the EU and India and the rest of the world, which of course put up the other half of the CO2 altogether. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we can solve this thing. All right, last question. If five years from now we would come back here and talk about this issue, and I were to ask you, you know, it's been five years since we first talked, how'd you do? What would you say? I would say that we have made tremendous progress, and that 2015, which is in two years, so now I'm, you know, we're three years yeah. from from your from your date. Uh, that was where we put the deal together in Paris, France, uh, at the UN Triple C. Uh, and, and came up with, with the, the strategy that's going to be enacted and what it's going to take for the world to pull together now and to really commit to that transition that we're talking about. But it's going to take the support of the private sector is the point. Okay, this, this, this cannot be led by the public sector and the NGO community alone. Uh, we've got to engage industry and the free markets have got to come and it's got to make sense in terms of a long-term investment. I think that one of the ways that that'll happen is if we get off the, the notion of a quarterly uh, return is the only thing that we can look at and there has to be a much longer view. And as we reframe what value is in our culture, in our societies uh, globally, uh, that's where the solution really is going to lie. Chip Cummins, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, 
one mind at a time. Rainmaker believes we can change.